Well, hello everyone. I'm Christina Henderson, Executive Director of the Montana High Tech Business Alliance. Welcome to our webinar, Passenger Rail in Montana, How Trains Could Transform Business Travel to Billings, Bozeman, Helena, Missoula, and Beyond with John Robert Smith. This event is part of a series the Alliance is hosting with resources to support our members. You can find details of these sessions at mthitech.org slash events. This webinar is a preview of the Montana Passenger Rail Virtual Summit to be held Thursday, September 17th. You can register to attend the free summit to learn how you can support the work of the Big Sky Passenger Rail Authority in Montana. Our presenter today, John Robert Smith, is Chair and Senior Policy Advisor for Transportation for America. After John Roberts' presentation, we will open the floor for Q&A with the audience. We would ask you to mute your microphones until you have something to say. And if you have a question or comment to share during the meeting, you can type it in the chat box or turn on your microphone to speak. Today's presentation will be recorded and available online. And I would now like to turn the floor over to John Robert Smith to get us started. Very good. Thank you, Christina. And thank you all for spending a little time with me uh, this morning uh, or afternoon, depending on where you are. I am in Mandeville, Louisiana, which is right across Lake Pontchartrain from New Orleans. So I decided to tempt you with the, uh, my daughter's backyard so you could see what it's like here in South Louisiana on this very beautiful September morning. Christina, if you'll go to the first slide. So I've enjoyed working with uh, Dave Strohmeyer and Christina and others looking at the passenger rail across Montana. Next slide. There you go. Uh, so, uh, John Robert Smith, I spent 20 years in local government service, 16 years as the mayor of my hometown, Meridian, Mississippi. It's a strong mayor form of government there. We're on the Mississippi-Alabama border. Uh, during my first term, which is now more than 30 years ago, we created the South's first multimodal transportation center, which you see in the background of this slide, bringing together passenger rail, um, from New Orleans to New York, inner city bus, local transit, access to our highways, uh, there in the downtown, very much an economic development project as much as a transportation project. In the midst of building that uh, transportation center, Amtrak cut service south of Atlanta. So there went one of my large modes of transportation. I organized the mayors from New Orleans to Atlanta, and we went to Capitol Hill to call on our uh, senators and congressmen. And after our visit, Senator Trent Lott, who was not the majority leader at the time, called Tom Downs, who was president of Amtrak, and said, Tom, I didn't know I cared about Amtrak, but apparently I do. So what do we need to resolve this issue of cutting service? Uh, from that, we were able to restore seven day a week service to most of the trains uh, that lost service at the time, unfortunately not those in your region. From that effort, I was appointed by President Bill Clinton to the Amtrak Board of Directors, uh, where I served for five years, the last two and a half years as chairman of the board. Uh, during that time, we rolled out Acela, the nation's high speed rail. Uh, for the first time, we also sustained the long distance trains across the country and grew the state supported uh, routes. Uh, I, my children would not let me seek a fifth term as mayor. So I was able to come to Washington DC and join Transportation for America at its inception. And I've been there for 12 years. And in that capacity, we provide uh, federal affairs uh, and policy advice to the Southern Rail Commission. Next slide. A little bit about Transportation for America. In essence, we're a national alliance of 
uh, local, state, and regional elected leaders that have come together to see that our voice uh, from these levels of government is heard at the state capitol and at the federal capitol as to our transportation needs for the people we serve, and most importantly, that there are federal and state dollars that flow with those transportation needs. We think the vision for transportation connectivity created at the local level is that which is best. Next slide. So Transportation for America works on both sides of the aisle. I was a Republican mayor all of those years in a city that had a 65% uh, majority Democrat population. So you learn very quickly that transportation solutions and really any investment in the built environment does not know whether it's Republican or Democrat. It knows whether it has a return on investment for the people you serve. So working um, with Senator Trent Lott and Senator Frank Lautenberg, a conservative from Mississippi and a liberal from New Jersey, uh, when I was on the Amtrak board, we were able to sustain passenger rail across the country. When the uh, authorization bill for surface transportation um, came to fruition, we had worked with Senator uh, Wicker from Mississippi, conservative Republican, and Senator Cory Booker from, again, New Jersey, liberal Democrat. Rail, passenger rail, had never been included in the surface transportation bill. It was highway and it was transit, but never passenger rail. Uh, we were able, working with their offices and with the Southern Rail Commission, actually include passenger rail in the surface transportation bill for the first time ever. And we created two funding streams that would allow you to invest in restoring passenger rail and operating passenger rail, the Chrissy Grant and the r &E Grant, which I'll explain more in detail. But we also can, created the Gulf Coast Working Group authorized by Congress, which required the Federal Railroad Administration to analyze restoring passenger rail service along the Gulf from New Orleans through Mobile, potentially into Florida. What would it take to restore it? What would be the cost to restore it? Um, how would it operate? What would be the payback to the communities? And that analysis was funded and appropriated by Congress uh, at a million dollars split over two fiscal years. I think this, you have an opportunity to get a lot of work done in the next authorization bill at the federal level to implement passenger rail throughout your region of the country. Next slide. The Chrissy Grant Program, Consolidated Rail Infrastructure and Safety Improvements Program, Basically, that provides funding at the federal level for all of the capital needs of restoring service. So it will be a passing siding, a bridge improvement, a crossing safety issues, anything that's in the built environment, including stations and surrounding um, improvements to those stations can be covered with a Chrissy grant. It ranges from 20 to 50% federal uh, match to non-federal and you can see the appropriations level. So when you consider that you're going to have to do some rail improvements to the freight rail right away, Chrissy is an existing program that will be reauthorized um, that could be a go-to source of funding for you. Next slide. The Restoration and Enhancement Grant Program is, provides operating support. So keep in mind, most of the shorter distance, what are now state supported routes in this country, were one time fully federally funded. So in order to give a new service such as Mobile to New Orleans through the Mississippi Gulf, um, an opportunity to build its name recognition, its ridership, its schedule, uh, we work to create the r and &E grant program, which gives you federal funding for operating support, 80% the first year of operation, 60% the second, 40% the third. So it allows you to ease into the full operating support that you will need to run a new service. And you see the appropriations levels there. Next slide. Now, the Gulf Coast Working Group, as I said, was created by Congress um, 
They charged FRA with the authority to manage the working group. Uh, it brought together the interest of those four states in um, reinstituting passenger rail service. We specifically wrote into the language that it would include the Southern Rail Commission, as well as the two railroads impacted and the FRA itself, fully funded at the federal government level, and it provides congressional oversight to what would be a lopsided negotiation with the host railroad. So for example, um, as we began this process, CSX, the host railroad, came to the working group and said, oh, well, we're going to need 2.3 billion, that's with a B, billion dollars to institute passenger rail service again. And of course, my reply was, we went to Mars for 2.4 billion. I'm just trying to get to Mobile. Uh, these numbers are totally out of line. And when the FRA did the analysis, it proved that in fact, it was $66 million needed to get uh, to Mobile. And um, in fact, Congress in the appropriations language fully accepted the Gulf Coast Working Group's assessment of need of capital, rather and specifically said they did not accept CSX uh, analysis. So you have some leverage that you would not have otherwise. Next slide. So the House, you know, took uh, a very aggressive position in passing what was first called the Invest Act, and now it's a Moving Forward Act. And as you see, Chrissy is reauthorized for five years at seven billion dollars. A lot of money to compete for. R&E at a hundred million over five years, that's the operating support, but they created a new program called Prime, which was $19 billion over five years. And the House not only authorized these levels, they appropriated these levels. Now that's only half the equation, obviously. You have to have uh, action out of the Senate Commerce to authorize and the Senate Appropriations to uh, provide the funding. Next slide. So in the midst of this, and we, by the way, we think we'll have very good results out of the Senate Commerce Committee chaired by Senator Wicker. We've uh, spent a good bit of time with Senator Cantwell from Washington State uh, that is ranking member and with uh, every member on the Commerce Committee. I think we're going to get a very, very robust authorization in the Senate when they finally act and would expect perhaps not the same 60 billion level of the House, but a significant investment in passenger rail out of the Senate. And again, we're gonna come out of COVID. It's how do we come out? Do we come out, do you really wanna come out just where you were? Or do you wanna come out with economies that are better linked with wise transportation choices? And I think that's where Congress is ultimately headed. So Amtrak supplemental request, you know, all, um, ridership, whether by aviation or bus or train, plummeted um, with the coronavirus pandemic and its uh, tremendous impact to this country. So Amtrak came back to Congress. Now keep in mind, Transit is asking for 32 billion with a B of support from Congress. Amtrak came back and said, we'd like a supplemental on top of the 2 billion they were given in the CARES Act we want a supplemental of 1.545 billion. And even if you give us that number, we're still going to cut all long distance trains to three days a week. And we're going to um, lay off, furlough almost 4,000 employees. Now, are those the choices you want to make in a, in a devastated economy uh, that we're in at this point? So next slide. We need to look at what is actually occurring in ridership now during and through uh, thus far through COVID. As you look at first the line graph and then the bar graph below, uh, you're looking at the blue line is a cellar, the high speed rail. Um, the yellow line is on the top is a long distance kind of orange line is the Northeast regional and then the state supported are the green line. But if you look at that, what system has returned fastest and shows the greatest change in bookings year over year? 
it's the long distance trains. If you look at the numbers of passengers carried uh, through this pandemic, it's the long distance trains that have done that um, with the state supported trains far out producing the uh, Acela or the Northeast regional lines. And today, the long distance trains are providing 60% of the revenue, of all revenue to Amtrak, more than the long distance, I mean, the state supported trains or the Northeast uh, Carter trains combined. Next slide. So uh, Amtrak said they would uh, save close to $300 million, $280 million by curtailing long distance service and um, laying off 3,700 people. The Amtrak labor did the analysis of what that would actually amount to by the time you transfer labor costs off of Amtrak and onto the general fund. And the true savings are only about $40 million. And that's with cutting service across the country and laying off 3,700 people. Next slide. But working with the Rail Passenger Association using the same modeling tool that we created for the service along the Gulf from New Orleans to Mobile, when you look at what service reduction does, for example, we've red boxed the Empire Builder. We looked at, at six different uh, trains of the 12 different, long, uh, 12 different long distance trains impacted Look at what it does to the local economy served by the Empire Builder. The impact of the Empire Builder to those economies is almost 600 million annually. When you cut it to three days a week, you're stripping out um, almost $300 million of revenue from those economies that are impacted. And this is based on state uh, tourism data from each of the states and localities impacted by the Empire Builder. So you see clearly that what was proposed to be 300 million in savings, which is actually 40 million if you're looking at just labor, then your 40 million also hammers just the Empire Builder by almost 300 million. I don't think those are the kind of choices that we want to make at the federal level. Next slide. Because if you lose passenger rail, you're not going to get it back. And you've seen that. You have lost service through the southern part of your state and you hadn't gotten it back yet. So I'm talking about ways that you can get it back now. So the Southern Rail Commission that I mentioned to you is a one of a kind um, entity. It was established by an act of Congress in 1982. The members of the commission are appointed by the governors of the three states. It's the only such commission with the authority that it has. It actually covers Alabama, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Uh, next slide. And they have been very successful in competing for uh, the Chrissy Grant, uh, receiving a total of $66 million and operating support of $20 million to connect those cities along the Gulf. But the commission also works to support the Crescent, which runs through Hattiesburg and Meridian, my hometown, to New York, and the city of New Orleans, which runs, of course, to Chicago and meets up with Empire Builder there, and then the Sunset Limited, which runs west to LA. Next slide. Um, we looked, we wanted to make a case of economic impact and economic development potential. You know, if you build an interchange on the interstate, you don't build it on how much you're gonna charge every car to get on. What you say is, look at the economic development that's going to be spurred by this interchange on the interstate. Well, think of passenger rail as an interstate of steel, and that station you develop and the stop you create for passenger rail is that interchange. So looking, looking at the Gulf Coast service, looking at the Gulf Coast service, we um, created a tool using working with the Trent Lott Center at the University of Southern Mississippi. And uh, so it, it's obviously not a liberal think tank that's running these numbers. It's a very conservative estimate. And the impact of this service annually to those three states is 
almost $550 million. Another construction, uh, obviously one time of 50 million, but you can see that when the states put up $33 million to match federal money for the needed capital investment, it is dwarfed by the annual uh, return in expected when that train starts running with two trains a day, every train receiving four stops. Next slide. The uh, important point to consider on the commission is once appointed, they are autonomous. So they don't have to go back through their DOT or back through their governor. Um, they have standing and can compete directly for a Chrissy grant or an R&E grant or for that prime grant that will be coming along. And we expect the matches to be reduced to a 10% non-federal and a 90% federal. So the commission is able to act quickly and act jointly and they support each other over a sustained vision. And, and so right now in this country, the any passenger rail investments are fragmented. You have different state policies, you have unreliable support from Amtrak at the present. Um, state policies change. You have a governor elected that says, nope, don't want to do passenger rail, and so the effort dies, and we've seen that happen in a number of cases. The advantage of the model of the Southern Rail Commission is that um, it, there are three states that have a regional vision. It doesn't change when you change your governor or a DOT secretary, so we're calling for the creation of five more of these interstate commissions, the governors of the states impacted, governors of the states impacted would appoint the commission members, there are six from each state. I think it's the perfect opportunity for you to create a big sky commission working with probably North Dakota, Idaho, uh, Washington State, perhaps Oregon, uh, to create the, the regional vision and work to implementation and to also create a big sky working group so that the analysis you'll need to do for whatever passenger rail you would like to implement or have aspired to implement um, uh, over the past 30 years, uh, you, you share, you get the federal government to pay for all of that analysis, report back to Congress. It gives you an immediate open door to then seek uh, the Chrissy grants, and you've already got a federal study showing what would be needed and it would show the economic impact to the region. So you have much more credibility. And we would also, uh, and this is language all being written in the Commerce Committee, uh, if you are such a commission, you would have um, a priority in when USDOT considers you for uh, a Chrissy grant or a prime grant that you have applied for. Next slide. So these are some of the possible lines you might have uh, in discussion as well as the existing route, which unfortunately, uh, given their own um, desires, Amtrak will cut to three days a week, but we're fighting that every single day. We actually wrote questions for the House T&I Rail Subcommittee, which had a hearing with Amtrak this morning um, and uh, have I believe you're going to see about 2.8 billion appropriated for Amtrak to sustain the uh, long distance system and prevent the furloughs because you've got to have the people to run the trains. If you get rid of the people who run the trains and how rapidly can you possibly return that service. So we work those issues um, would, you know, certainly I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, work with you. I became aware, I've been in Montana uh, doing work a good bit, uh, also provide policy advice to localities and, and have done that in Montana uh, and in Idaho and the, your surrounding states. But when I was making my rounds on Capitol Hill to be confirmed um, for appointment to the Amtrak board, the senators in especially um, uh, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, and Washington State 
made me swear that I would not be a part of cutting any further rail service in the country. So I knew it was of critical importance to you then, unfortunately, as we began to expand our program, we had a president elected who zeroed out all Amtrak, so it was a great fight just to sustain that which we had. But I think you have an opportunity to take an aspiration of 30 years of restoration of service and make it a reality. So, Christina, with that, I'll be happy to take questions. Okay. Well, we'll open it up to our audience if anybody has initial questions. Feel free to either share in the chat or unmute yourself and um, speak. Either way will work. One initial question I have for you, John Robert, is if you look at our current um, northern route, it really is more of a tourism oriented route or for people who are trying to get from a bigger city in the central US out to Seattle, let's say. Um, whereas the southern route for, a, for us in Montana could legitimately be a um, commuting or um, business travel train route because it hits our major population centers. Um, can you offer any insights as to um, you know, the differences between the two and how we can wrap our minds around the impact or understanding it. Because a lot of folks, as I've talked to them about this possibility and the, the work of the, um, the newly forming Rail Commission, their, their minds think about trains in a tourism box and they've not at all considered the possibility of in-state in or intrastate commuting. Sure, sure. It's, and it's, it's not one or the other. It's not the empire builder or connecting cities along the, the southern uh, tier of Montana. And you see this played out in the Southern Rail Commission. They fight to sustain the Crescent and the city of New Orleans, which are long distance trains and have a great deal of tourist value. And if you look at the empire builder, those numbers are based on your, not just your tourism number, but how many people board and, and deboard at your stops in Montana. So there is a significant tourist impact in Montana. And I know Whitefish did a great tiger project around their main street to make it a much more walkable, livable place and connecting into those rail services. But having traveled through Montana, I know just what you said, your population bases are in the southern part of the state. So as we look at the service between New Orleans and Mobile, it's those population centers and it's, it's connecting military bases, it's connecting the shipbuilding employers to the workforce. So there is many Mississippians who go to Mobile for shipbuilding and shipping jobs as there are Alabamians and Louisianians who come to Mississippi for the shipbuilding. So it's also about connecting employers to the employee base. You have to have a schedule that makes sense, which we've incorporated that into the service along the Gulf. It has to be connecting the business centers that you do have uh, in each one of those places, um, not all of which are tourism by any means, um, and when you have the further impact of distance in Montana, because having traveled there while Mississippi and much of Louisiana and Alabama are rural, Montana's frontier. You're not, your know, people will say you're a rural, rural state. Well, no, you're, you're actually a frontier state. And there's a lot of, of space between that must be negotiated. And oftentimes the weather is not conducive to that. And as you look at the economic development potential for your cities, and I think your, your manufacturers and your uh, corporate headquarters um, will all tell you that in looking for the next generation of employees, they're that millennial generation we hear about so much, which Christina, you may actually be one of those. And um, 
they're looking for places you, you must have broadband connectivity, which we also work for challenging places, but you've got to have a downtown that pops and then you've got to be connected to the larger region. So when I was visiting your colleges in Montana, one thing the students told me was that they have a car on campus as a way to get home for the holidays. If they actually live in one of the cities that would be connected by rail if they had it. And that would be a way that they could safely use to go back and forth. And your instructors, your professors said the same thing. So it's a, if you're going to play in the economic development paradigm of the future, decisions of where to locate jobs uh, are more and more predicated on where those employees want to be. And you've got to be connected in some way other than the private automobile. And you already, I mean, you can't fly from one city in Montana to another city in Montana directly, I believe. You fly somewhere else and fly back in. And of course, aviation is curtailing their essential air service all across the country. And it's going to hit Mississippi and Montana and Maine, uh, those states particularly hard. You don't want to be left with only an automobile as your choice. Yeah, we started paying attention to this issue of rail at the request of our member companies who said this would be phenomenal for our business and make it easier for us to reach our customers in cities across Montana and also that they would be more likely to open new offices in additional cities in Montana if they knew they had more convenient transportation yeah, to get yeah. there. And reach their workforce and of course keep in mind even on the long distance system now you have wi-fi so in one of the selling points along the gulf is if it's if you're not using it for recreation it's strictly for business then you've got a two to a three hour trip that is all productive where if you drive that that's three hours lost so you can be as engaged and work from that train just like you can be um that you couldn't be if you were in an automobile and really couldn't be if you were flying today. So I, that's surprising to me. Are all of the long distance Amtrak trains currently Wi-Fi enabled? So you we could have work? Wi-Fi now. There are, I know in my trip, because I, I practice what I preach, I ride the trains. And in headed to, from my hometown in Meridian to uh, Washington, D.C., there will be a dead spot up in the mountains um, as you get out of uh, Atlanta and you're following that ridge line. There will be a dead stop, but dead spot, but it comes and goes. And of course, as long as you have cell service, then you've got your Wi Fi connected. But Amtrak has employed um, Wi Fi on its trains. And actually, the trains we use along the Gulf, we're looking at some new equipment because we, if you, you only get one chance to start something new and we want to make a real bold splash with it. And um, Wi-Fi will be a, a specific uh, concentration to make sure that it's absolutely seamless on that route. And we'll also control, while Amtrak may have the conductor and engineer, um, the Southern Rail Commission wants to control the onboard experience so that we'll be serving food and beverages that are indicative of our three states. So your immersion in, in our Southern culture begins when you step on the train, not when you get off. So think in terms of it's, it's not only good for business and good for tourism, it's an experience that can be as productive as you want it to be while you're on that train. Mm -hmm. John Robert, you also mentioned earlier the bipartisan support of rail and the associated economic development. Can you comment on what you've seen to date in Montana's initial exploration of, of rail um, expansion? Absolutely. Um, both Senator Tester and Senator Daines have been absolutely um, supportive and very strong on Number one, defending the service you have. And then number two, are there ways to grow service along the, the southern route? They, they are concerned. They don't want anyone to think they're giving up the northern route. And I certainly understand that, nor should they give it up. 
Um, but I know the offices have talked to Senator Wicker's office about uh, the support of such a commission and wanting to make sure that they would be a part of that. And so if you're going to have five, and I've got West Virginia's two senators, a Republican and a Democrat, talking to Senator Wicker about wanting such a commission. Uh, what I'm finding is in this horribly divided Congress on every single issue, if you listen to the confirmation hearing for two Amtrak board member nominees, we had Senator Moran from Kansas, very conservative. Senator Testers was there. Uh, Senator Rosen, Senator Wicker, Senator Cantwell. The only question they wanted answered was, do you commit to support passenger rail through our states that exist and how it may be grown? So you're, we're finding that this is not a partisan issue. At one time, it was hard to get Republicans to support rail. Not anymore. And the reason is because they're hearing from people like you. And it's not about nostalgia. It's about positioning you for a healthy economy, especially now coming out of COVID. So yes, your senators, I've worked with their staff. I, Dave knows because I always copy him um, on my emails to them. Uh, I send almost daily reports on ridership and revenue um, to those Senate offices. I always hear back and they're always very responsive. So I don't take any sides in this. We're nonpartisan, but I can tell you who supports it and who doesn't support it. And you're, you're blessed both sides of the aisle and your state support it. That's great to hear. Uh, we had a few questions submitted ahead of time. Um, so I'll read those out. First, we, we had a question about, can we coordinate with nearby states for wider coverage? And maybe what would that look like? Sure. sure. Well, well, you know, one way to do it, and, and I applaud the effort within Montana to create the authority, um, but that authority won't reach outside of Montana. So that's where the commission takes you, and the, the authority can't apply directly for federal grants. So the commission takes you from that, which is a very necessary step, by partnering with, and we've had Idaho on the calls. I know they're very interested there. Uh, and, and of course, we're working through local government leaders and local business leaders. Um, and uh, we've had several calls with Washington State. I just had a call last, uh, day before yesterday with Washington's governor's staff about the creation of such a commission. Um, so yes, you want it to be a commission to be more than one state. And with the Southern Rail Commission, the authorizing language allows us to also invite adjacent states. So we can invite Florida, or Georgia, or Tennessee, Arkansas, Texas to join. Um, as you could do if you started with Idaho and Montana, you could then invite North Dakota, any adjacent state. And there's real interest in you know, Colorado in a connection it would make sense uh, working into your alliance. So get it started with states that agree and the governors that will appoint, and then you can add other states as you move forward. Yeah, think about it. What I'm trying to do with these commissions, the more of these commissions we have, the more senators I have to leverage when something happens. We had another question about having a pollution reducing train like they do on the east coast um, for people simply crossing the state. Um, could you maybe comment on that and also about the potential environmental benefits of converting some of our um, car traffic to trains? Well you know the greatest in, um, environmental impact is created by transportation. It's not by our industries anymore. You know, by and large, we're not belching out smoke in the environment anymore in our industries. But transportation continues to do that. You know, obviously, short hop air flights, as much as I love them in Mississippi, or you do in Montana, they're most inefficient uh, ways to travel. But it's the personal automobile um, and the um, you know, combustion engine that today are providing the greatest impact to the environment. Passenger rail 
um, is the least impactful, even with you know, the diesel service that we have in my part of the world is still by far the least impactful of any of the modes of transportation serving our region. Now, in the, on the East Coast, the author of that question may be thinking about the, what they call the silver service, which allows you to pull your car on a, a long uh, auto rack and you store your car and then you have a sleeper on the train and it'll take you down to Florida where you then offload the car and you experience all there is uh, in Florida. That's called the auto train. And certainly that is, um, reduces even further the environmental impact. Um, the trains in the corridor, Northeast corridor, are electrified, which reduces it even more. But I think the odds of electrifying corridors through you know, the Mississippi Gulf now or through Montana are, are very, very small. You can still accomplish a great deal of positive impact to the environment just with a passenger train taking all those what would be automotive trips off the highways. And it reduces, you know, one reason Mississippi DOT is so supportive is they realize the more people I take off the highway in Mississippi, the less I'm going to have to repair those highways in Mississippi. And we don't have the freezing and thawing issues that you have you know, in the Northwest. Uh, so DOTs can see this as a cost reduction uh, issue for their maintenance and repair. Did that answer the question? I think so. Um, if folks have follow-up questions, feel free to, to shout them out. Uh, we also had some questions from folks that are living uh, in cities that are maybe off of the proposed path of the Southern route. Um, specifically, we had someone in Malta, or say that Malta was their closest Amtrak station, um, which is four hours each way and 500 miles round trip, um, but that they would benefit from passenger service along I-90, is there an efficient way to move passengers from more remote areas like Mar County or White Sulphur Springs is located to a train station? So do you have any thoughts on sure. you know, so, your point earlier about Montana's enormous geography, ways that more, more of our rural communities could participate in the benefits of the train? Well, Amtrak has run a connecting bus, bus service. So it's an Amtrak branded bus from Meridian to Dallas-Fort Worth. Now that's a long stretch, but they pick up um, in Jackson, Mississippi, the capital, for example, that would take you over to Meridian and then you can ride the train to uh, New York. It also picks up all of Northern Louisiana. So Monroe and Ruston and Shreveport are connected. And then it, for our Mississippians, it could connect us to the Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport. So Amtrak's already doing that. As a part of the Gulf service, we look at additional Amtrak bus routes, and they can be, they can be privatized, um, those bus routes. So we'd connect from um, Mobile to Montgomery um, or to Birmingham to the next bus service. Uh, we could connect over to Pensacola, Florida, which would connect uh, by bus back into Mobile. Uh, there are also points, obviously, in Louisiana. Baton Rouge could be connected to New Orleans now by bus, later by rail. So yes, there's already an existing model to connect fairly far distances by an Amtrak label bus connecting you to the route. The, the beauty of, of that connection is you buy one ticket. And it gets you on the bus, your bags are on the bus. When the bus gets to the train station, your bags are located or loaded onto the train and you have the same ticket to use whether you're on the bus or the train. So yes, there are ways to make that work. And with those sorts of kind of additional transportation options, would those be part of the analysis that would be done by the working group? Yes. And, and that's what we did in ways to connect um, first by bus service with the aspiration that it would then be by rail service. So if you prove that there's a significant ridership from the capital of Alabama, which is Montgomery, down to Mobile, 
you, you prove there's a ridership, then you make the next step of saying, okay, rather than a bus, now let's make it a rail connection. We had a question that's fairly specific, but I'll pose it to you in case you have comment about a BUD, B-U-D-D, -D, car system from Great Falls to Helena. Um, and whether it would be feasible to open up such a line between Helena and Great Falls. Um, do you have any thoughts on the feasibility of that suggestion? I don't know the bud uh, cars that were specifically res uh, referenced and their manufacturers that are building additional what they call um, uh, MDUs. I may have my acronym wrong, but there, it doesn't have a locomotive. It has a power car on one end or perhaps on both ends. So in, in between New Orleans and Mobile, we're looking at a, a power car system to, on both ends so that we don't have to turn the train around because that can be a limiting factor if you're having to turn the locomotive or turn the train. It's, it's basically called a push me, pull you uh, system. Uh, so yes, in a shorter distance. You wouldn't want to go a long distance, but we could do the New Orleans to Mobile route with such a system if we wanted to do that. Excellent, thank you. What's the, what's the difference? The distance is what, 90 something miles between hell yeah. and Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very serviceable distance for um, a bud type or a power car type of system. Great. I have a question regarding, you know, in terms of both protecting the existing long distance rail that we have in Montana, and then also in supporting the initiatives to expand our rail to the Southern route. Do you have um, suggestions for ways that business leaders um, whether it's private businesses or associations like ours, um, can be supportive and make our voices heard as these conversations are happening around economic impact, benefits to business. What are some things that we can be thinking about doing uh, to support rail if we want to see this happen? Well, of course, the business voice um, is very impactful to your senators and your congressperson. So they need to hear from you because they will you know, there, there are a lot of wonderful people out there that believe in passenger rail, but they believe in it because they remember it so fondly when they were a boy. And that's been many years ago. So it's a, in many cases, a backward looking view of passenger rail. The business community won't take a backward looking view, they'll take a forward looking view. And so I think your voice is particularly impactful. And honestly, I think it's the business voice that has helped change a lot of fiscally conservative minds when it comes to passenger rail. Keep in mind, there is no um, transportation system for human beings in the world that pays for itself out of the fare box. You read about all these wonderful trains in other parts of the world, they were built out by their national government. They may have different operators but it was a national investment. Your highway system, the gas tax does not cover your, the full cost of your highway system at all. Um, it's about $40 billion a year has to go from the general fund into the highway trust fund just to make it balance. And that won't be enough now. Aviation, if, if I were flying to Montana and my ticket had to cover TSA agents, air traffic control, build the airport, build the runways. Um, my ticket would be tens of thousands of dollars. All of those things are paid for out of the general fund. The air traffic control system that keeps us from flying into each other, that's all a federal obligation. Aviation, uh, aviation industry doesn't pay for that. So when you think about that, then why would you expect passenger rail to pay for itself out of the fare box? It is very much a needed transportation service, just like air, just like transit, just like highways. It needs a strong federal part. Thank you for that. Um, are there any other final questions from our audience? I'll allow 
little bit of space. Here's Dave Stromer. Um, hey, 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 Christina. Dave, let me turn the floor over to you. You can comment on, on the link and the upcoming event. Yeah, well, thanks so much, uh, Christina, and thanks to the high tech, Montana High Tech Business Alliance for uh, not only hosting today's event, but also being a co-sponsor of the upcoming summit. And thanks so much, John Robert, for this teaser today, which was a meaty teaser. Uh, you, you really added a lot of substance to this discussion. I appreciate it, and I appreciate uh, the kids uh, tempting us, diving into the pool in the background there. But yeah, uh, one week from tomorrow, September 17th from 10 a.m. until 1 p.m., we will be hosting a virtual Montana uh, Passenger Rail Summit. And John Robert Smith, who uh, was our guest today, will be participating in that along with one of his colleagues, Beth Osborne from the uh, organization that he's with, Transportation for America. We'll have the CEO of uh, the Rail Passengers Association, uh, uh, Jim Matthews, uh, Secretary of Transportation for the state of Washington, just a whole range of great speakers. And I think John Robert hit the nail on the head that this event and, and this initiative that we're talking about today is all about positioning ourselves for the future and not just creating the transportation and economic world that existed eight months ago, but setting us our, ourselves up for success to emerge from this pandemic stronger and, and, uh, and better and more nimble than we are today. So www.montanapassengerrailsummit.org, get on there, uh, check out the details of the event and register and we hope to see you there next Thursday. Thank you, Dave, and thank you so much for your leadership in, in uh, helping to make this vision um, a reality in Montana. I've been so impressed with the momentum that you and your team have built, even during this crazy pandemic time. So thank you for all your leadership in that. You're welcome. You're welcome. And the, the um, leadership at the local level is so absolutely critical. You know, I, I didn't know Dave didn't know he was an office out in Montana. I hadn't met him on any other previous trip. But you've got to have someone like Dave at the local level who immediately gets it, who then becomes a hard charging driver that brings in the other voices. And I really appreciate the business community being such a strong um, proponent. And uh, Dave mentioned Beth Osborne will be on the um, convening uh, that, that Dave is hosting. Beth was Assistant Secretary for Policy to the U.S. Department of Transportation under Secretary Ray LaHood. She helped create the Tiger Grant Program and administered it for the first six years of its existence, which is now a Bill Grant Program. So Beth brings a federal hill and agency perspective from DOT that is critical in the work that, that I do and that we do together, and I think will be critical to Dave uh, in this convening. Yes, thank you so much. Um, and I will say as well, Dave is uh, in Missoula County, Missoula County Commissioner, but a lot of the interest that I heard first when Missoula started this initiative came from Bozeman and from tech leaders in other parts of the state. So this really is a I think across state interest from the business community. And it's um, proof that business doesn't necessarily follow um, the same boundaries in terms of counties or cities. Like business is operating across Montana really as one collective, in our case, tech economy. And so the, the um, inter-community collaboration is really encouraging to see and is going to be an important part of, of seeing this initiative come to fruition. So we appreciate um, the cross-state support as well. Um, so for those of you that are interested in participating in that event on the 17th, there's a link in the chat. So you can grab the link that Dave mentioned from the chat. We will also send it out when we send out the video um, to everyone who's registered. So feel free to share this video and the related information with your friends and colleagues. Um, we'd love to see you uh, register for that summit, which is free and will allow you to learn even more about um, the progress of this initiative and the opportunities that come with it. So with that, unless anyone has a final question to pose, 
we will wrap up. Again, thank you to John Robert for joining us today. Uh, register for that uh, Montana Passenger Rail Virtual Summit on September 17th. And thank you to John Robert and our audience for joining us today. Have a great day.